What's up, Fun Ahead fans? Thanks so much for tuning in to Fun Ahead TV. This is yet another episode about my 2005 Porsche Boxster S, which I am sitting in currently, and it is very much in service mode uh, because in the last episode, we took the engine out. In this episode, we're gonna go ahead and start tearing into this thing. We're gonna get the transmission off. We're gonna start taking just a lot of like, auxiliary things off the engine so that we can start you know, really disassembling the engine and getting down to the core of what the issue is. So if you missed the previous content on this car, basically I bought this uh, 2005 Porsche Boxster S knowing that it had a pretty serious engine issue. Uh, it's got a pretty loud tick. Yeah, not ideal. But the thing of it is, it only happens after the engine is has been warmed up sufficiently, like as in driven quite hard, and it only does it at idle. Above idle, the tick goes away. Uh, and you can't hear it. In fact, I have never heard the tick. Uh, I've driven it a couple hundred miles, but inevitably there is a tick and we gotta figure out what's going on. <sighs> there is in fact metal in the oil. I did see this, I didn't film it. Unfortunately, it was very hard to uh, actually show that on camera. But when I drained the oil out of the drain pan that I put this engine's oil into, uh, it was out in the sun. I was pouring it into my, I have an oil receptacle outside and it was very obvious that there was quite a bit of glitter in the bottom of this drain pan, which had been previously cleaned out and there was no metal in it. We are still waiting on the oil analysis to come back from Blackstone. That'll tell us exactly what kind of metal it is, which will tell us what the metal is coming from most likely. But with all that being said, we are having uh, some level of mechanical issue inside of this engine that we have yet to determine. So that is why we're going to the effort of tearing down the engine. Plus, you know, like I had mentioned in the previous content on this car, this car is 18 years old now and it has almost 100,000 miles. So inevitably it's going to need a lot of the, you know, plastic bits, uh, air oil separator, timing chain guides, plus, you know, while you're in there, stuff like clutch, pressure plate, flywheel, all of which are original to this engine from the factory. So we're gonna go through, refresh all sorts of stuff while we're in there and get to the bottom of what the heck it is that's going wrong with this engine and making that metal. I'm gonna go ahead and shut up now. Let's get to it. Let's just for fun, have a quick look at these. So the clutch, this is an original clutch, by the way, original flywheel and everything. Uh, actually, the clutch had a decent bit of life left in it, so that's that. The pressure plate and flywheel obviously have gotten quite hot at some points. You can see all these heat marks in them. Um, and then the other thing um, is that the dual mass flywheel is still good, uh, but it, you know, it moves pretty easily. You know, it's not out of spec with the amount of back and forth play that it has in it. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's uh, gonna be good to replace this. Nothing too exciting inside the bell housing the transmission. Uh, obviously, we'll be replace this, uh, the clutch throwout arm, uh, and actually the throwout bearing still feels good, uh, but it will be replaced as well. Um, and we just kind of see some, some grease that was indicative of the oil leak that we had from the back of the motor, uh, which we knew about when we did the uh, initial inspection of the car. Let's go look at the engine. Here we are at the engine. Uh, the infamous IMS bearing location here. Uh, it's honestly pretty hard to tell if it's the IMS bearing flange leaking or if it is the rear main seal. But you can see here there is some, some wetness from the rear main seal, so that's leaking no matter what. Uh, but it is strange that we don't see you know, the amount of dirt collection from, from oil running down the engine. The dirt collection from from dirt sticking to oily surfaces kind of starts around the IMS bearing. Anyway, nothing crazy out of the ordinary with this, obviously. You know, we can see that the rear main seal definitely needs done uh, regardless. And um, let's take a look inside the intermediate shaft bearing and see what we're working with here. Well, <laughs> I just discovered something quite surprising. 
I don't know if any of you eagle-eyed viewers caught that uh, beforehand, but I certainly didn't because I wasn't looking for it. If you look at that stamp right there, that says LN or LN Engineering, which is the one of the primary companies that sells the IMS bearing upgrade for these engines, which means that's not the original IMS bearing. This has been done before, which is crazy because there is no nowhere on that car is the sticker, or at least not that I've seen, and also nowhere in the maintenance history does it say that that this bearing has been done before. I'll have to go back and comb through the maintenance history again and see if I can't figure out maybe when this was done. I'm gonna go ahead and get these bolts off and we will uh, take a look at what we're working with here. Okay, so we got that off and this bearing looks extremely healthy. Like as I'm shaking this shaft, there is absolutely no play in it. Um, this bearing is in solid shape. Obviously, too, these things are known to last a long time. So anyway, good to know that this bearing is in very good shape. I wanted to do this before putting this engine on the engine stand because obviously the engine stand bolts onto the transmission side of the engine, which would have given us very little to no access to the IMS flange. But uh, anyway, now we know. Well, we got the engine resting on the engine stand now. On the note of kind of further diagnosing what could be going on, if you recall uh, from the first video I made about this car, we had a cylinder four misfire code set uh, in the DME. Here is cylinder four. Now that we're pulling off auxiliary items, let's go ahead and pull off all of these spark plugs and coil packs uh, and see if we see any one spark plug kind of out of the norm. Um, if so, you know, that could maybe potentially uh, be some further evidence as to what the heck is actually going on. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Alrighty. Well, here we go with the spark plug and coil pack analysis. This is the spark plug from cylinder four. You can see what it looks like. It looks pretty good. It was, I would say that this cylinder was burning fairly well um, and compared to cylinders five and six, there are no major glaring differences, I would say. I suppose there is a little bit of uh, soot on the cylinder four spark plug that isn't shown on the other two. You know, it's hard to say at this time whether that's, you know, like a, a persistent long-term misfire that, that had been happening um, but I don't know it's not like a concerning amount of soot you can tell the the combustions that are happening are very similar between the two because the spark plugs are very similar color to me this doesn't seem like there would be any glaring signs that you know this cylinder is burning a ton of oil versus this one or anything it, it kind of just maybe seems like it, it's very possible that due to the um, the misfires that occurred that you know maybe we could have seen this additional amount of soot but it's not like any crazy amount of glaring soot. Anyway, inconclusive is what I'm calling this. Nothing, nothing ridiculously different between all three of them to say, hey, actually, cylinder four is having an issue. At least not with regards to bore scoring or something along those lines. Uh, anyway, probably off camera, I'm gonna go ahead and pull these other three spark plugs and coil packs. If something comes up and is cool and exciting, I'll point it out. If not, we're just gonna keep moving on to the rest of the engine.
as you all saw in that series of time lapses, we now have the engine completely, you know, torn down with regards to all the auxiliary stuff that goes on the top and on the front of the motor. So now that that's all stripped down, what next? Well, because we're having an issue supposedly with cylinder four, I am most interested in what's going on with bank two. So let's take the valve cover off of bank two, start tearing that down first and see what we're working with if we can find anything glaring. One thing to point out that is kind of fun and interesting, when we look into the hole where the uh, oil uh, fill tube goes into, we can see that is the number four connecting rod. And off camera, I was doing a little bit of finagling with the connecting rod to see if I could feel any amount of play. Uh, and, you know, obviously with, the, with it being so buried in the engine, we're not going to be able to, you know, get in, any uh, real grip on it to be able to tell if it's, if it's moving or not. But from what I can tell, it is uh, holding very steady and does not have any play in it. Um, but it is kind of cool that, you know, that is the one in question. We couldn't see it from the bottom side, but here it is, uh, clear as day on the top side. I did also try the drumstick test to see if I could hear anything weird, which is where you hit the top of the piston to see if you hear any strange sounds. And if you have a very bad connecting rod bearing, then that will sound like when you hit the top of the piston like that, it will sound extremely hollow. Uh, obviously in this case, it just sounded like a drumstick hitting metal. Either that is an okay connecting rod bearing or if, if anything, it's in the very early stages of failing. As far as everything else that came off, uh, everything looked pretty good. Um, you know, all the idlers and everything I think have probably been replaced in the vehicle's lifetime. And also the water pump actually looks very good. Uh, I'm not going to pick it up because I have all the, all the bolts for it set just so, but uh, the bearing is in great shape. I know, I do know from the maintenance history that that thing was replaced not too terribly long ago. I want to say maybe 20,000 ish miles ago. And those are usually good for about 50,000 miles. So in that case, you know, this thing has a lot of life left in it. So you wouldn't expect there to be any weird bearing noise or play in the bearing. But anyway, aside from that, yeah, like I said, everything looks really solid. Um, and we are going to proceed with taking the valve cover off of bank two. Made some progress just now, as you saw, we have everything but the lifter carrier uh, taken off the motor. We are able to kind of get an insight into a lot of what we just took off. So let's go take a quick look at that stuff. All right, so I've got everything just kind of set up on my workbench here, kind of a clean zone that I like to set up for myself before doing anything with engine parts. Um, first and foremost, let's take a quick look at the timing chain guide. So these actually look really good. This is the tensioning guide, obviously. Uh, and you can see that there's, let me try to get it in the light here. Yeah, look at this thing. See if you can try to catch that in the light. There's some scoring, of course, because you've got timing chain running up against this at very high speeds. But all in all, that thing's in great shape. Let's look at the non-tensioning side. There was some pitting on this side. Uh, let's see. Here's some very minor pitting. And then on the on this end, there's some minor pitting here as well. Uh, but all in all, this thing's in uh, really solid shape, so that's good. But regardless, uh, we're going to replace that because, you know, we're in there. We might as well. Cams uh, look good. I mean, nothing out of the ordinary here, as you can see. This is the exhaust cam on bank two. You know, nothing weird. Intake cam on bank two. Again, nothing weird. Um, I can definitely tell that this bank has been opened up before. This thing has probably been retimed before, and you can tell because um, someone probably improperly um, put this thing back in time. This The end of this cam is actually broken. Um, and part of the procedure is as you are torquing down this uh, intake cam adjuster, uh, you're supposed to take off the thing that locks the cams in on the other end, and my guess is that they did not do that. And as a result, popped this thing off. Uh, while they were torquing this end. Um, that is my guess. So obviously the cams have been out of this bank before, 
which you know we had a hunch based on the amount of non-factory looking sealant that was around this valve cover. So interesting, I wonder why someone has been in here before. It's not crazy obvious to me. Maybe they were replacing the timing chain guys, but it's possible too that they were maybe investigating a lifter tick or something like that because you know, maybe this motor has been making this kind of noise for a while. And so they were maybe chasing some issue under the valve cover. Oh, the other thing, I figure while we're looking at uh, timing chain guides, this one looks immaculate. Look at this thing. This is the one that sits between the between the two cams to kind of tension the, the top of the chain there. All right, so let's look at these lifters. Some of these actually don't look the best to me. So this is uh, cylinder four, five, and six. First of all, the reason these are, are you know, have some circular marks on them is because these actually spin in the lifter carrier. Uh, you know, there's nothing holding them. There's no dowel pins. The, 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 the later version of the lifters for the Variocam Plus uh, did have little dowels that held the lifters in one orientation, uh, but these lifters do not have that. But what's interesting to me is that, you know, there's some of these, for example, this one definitely has a decent bit of like marking on it, which is kind of strange. All right, so actually, yeah, I had my glove on before, but when I, I can feel that mark with my fingernail. That is a definite groove. So that would be this cam lobe that is doing that. All right, so we're focused on this lobe right here, and I'm not seeing, you know, like an equal and opposite marking. It's uh, it's unclear to me what would have been causing, you know, a mark like that around the lifter. They all kind of have some swirling, of course, but when you look at it, like this one has a mark, this one has a definite, I can feel it with my fingernail mark, this one less so, but these two are pretty bad. These are hydraulic lifters. The way these work is there's some spring pretension in them, but the lifter carrier is able to flow oil into it, and then oil actually goes into this little hole to keep the lifter inflated. And if the lifter was collapsing, which actually we can check that now. Oh wow. Holy cow. Oh my gosh. Let's back up. <laughs> So these are the cylinder four lifters. In this case, I just happened to flip this one over when I was sitting here talking and push this. And you can see this very easily, like this is strictly spring pressure here. There is no resistance there. Whereas if I do this lifter, I'm pushing it, I'm pushing it and I cannot, I can't push that down. That's, that's how a lifter should feel. It should stay inflated. When you think about the engine RPM at idle, and then you consider how often, you know, engine RPM at idle, roughly 700, divide that by two, so these are spinning at 350 RPMs at idle. And that, therefore, is the number of times per second, roughly, that we're hearing the sound in, in with regards to the lifter tick. If it was a Conrad bearing failure, you would be hearing it at twice the frequency. And so with that, you can kind of do the math uh, with a stopwatch. misdiagnose bore scoring all the time to be lifter tick. But in this case, again, due to my frequency argument, the amount of times per second we're hearing the tick, it does kind of lend itself to being a lifter. Given what I just said about hydraulic lifters, consider what I said before about when the previous owner heard this sound. He heard it when he had just been driving the car very hard, AKA coolant temps and oil temps were elevated. And when oil temps are elevated, your oil is more uh, thin. So therefore, it is harder for thinner oil to keep a bad lifter inflated, especially down at idle when your oil pump is running very slowly, your oil pressure is not as high, so then it's very difficult to keep a lifter inflated. Therefore, this would make a tick sound. Oh! So this is what a failed lifter actually looks like. So this is crazy. This is cylinder four, and we happen to 
see already one failed lifter. Let me go through and see if we have any other ones. Okay, that one's the exhaust one, lower left exhaust for cylinder four that was inflated. Lower right exhaust, that one's inflated, so, all right, cylinder five. Ooh, this one's bad too. Ah, and what's the coincidence? This is the other one that has a ring around it. Okay, so that one can't inflate and it has a ring. This one is still good and also no ring. This one is good, the lower left exhaust for cylinder five. This one is good, the lower right exhaust for cylinder five. Cylinder six, let's see. That one is good. Okay, that one is good. Both intakes for cylinder six are good. Ooh, this one's failing. It, out a little, it has a little bit of, mm, yeah, I would say that has some play to it. This one's the exhaust. Mm, and that one's good. These three lifters have play and are struggling to hold oil pressure. You know, this isn't definitively the answer. However, noisy lifters could have been the culprit. So if the camshaft is running, is rubbing weirdly on a failing lifter, then it's very possible that that is where we are seeing uh, the metal coming from. All right, so as exciting and potentially telling as this situation is with finding these three bad lifters, that could potentially be our issue. But I say potentially because it's only maybe part of the issue. These lifters are for sure bad, but we haven't yet ruled out the failing connecting rod bearing. I don't wanna go assuming that it's this and then put the whole engine together and back up in the car and then we still have a tick. That would be bad. Then we have to tear off everything back down again and, and go redo the bearings. So this is either completely our culprit or part of the culprit, but regardless, this engine does in fact need new lifters. quick analysis of the lifters in a similar way that we did for the bank two ones. So this is cylinder one, two, three. Now, of course, we weren't having any issues with noise on this side of the engine. Just for the sake of being thorough, let's go ahead and check if any of these are bad. So right away, you can see this lifter's good. Yep, okay, that one feels good. Exhaust side, cylinder one, good, good. Cylinder two, feels great. The first intake one, feels great. Feels very good. Feels good. Oh, shit. Feels very good. First one intake on cylinder three. Very solid intake cylinder three. Very solid. And last but not least, this is last one. So this entire bank, uh, every one of these lifters is holding very soundly. Um, what's interesting is we don't see the same level of wear on these lifters. You know, of course, we do have the swirl pattern, which is consistent with uh, what we saw on bank two. Uh, but that's not unusual, of course, like as I said. These lifters do turn in the uh, lifter carrier. Regardless, very interesting. We see exactly zero uh, bad lifters in uh, bank one, but we have three in bank two. Aside from lifters, and aside from the fact that there is no evidence of you know anyone ever having been inside of bank one, nothing really to note. Anyway, you guys are the best. I really appreciate you guys watching. Please like this video if you enjoy this content and subscribe if you're not already and you want to see more content like it in the near future. Thank you all so much for tuning in to Fun Ahead TV as always and I'll talk to you guys in the next episode.